In Blueprint for Truth, I believe Richard Gage minimizes the power of gravity, and I've already offered 86 reasons why his controlled demolition theory seems extremely unlikely to me. I believe Richard also minimizes the power of air pressure, as we will see when we discuss the lateral ejection of steel beams and the squibs that appear during the collapse. To paraphrase Richard, lateral ejection of multi-ton steel pieces is evidence that this collapse has all the features of a controlled demolition, except when it doesn't. Successful controlled demolitions never shoot steel beams hundreds of feet into nearby buildings. This phenomenon is much more likely caused by random elements of a natural collapse, not a planned demolition. Richard claims that this was a deceptive controlled demolition, explosive in nature. Could that be to make the destruction even more terrorizing? Well, then why not topple the buildings entirely on their sides and really terrorize us? Now, I admit this is all conjecture, but I just can't imagine the why for any of this. Richard uses this chart showing how far the ejected objects went horizontally. He claims that the higher the steel beams were, they should have gone further because they started higher up and would have gone further across. But the opposite is true. Look at this video. If it were a controlled demolition, then lateral ejection of dust would be even throughout the collapse. But dust ejection starts slowly when the building is collapsing slowly, and then very gradually increases in intensity with no sudden increase in intensity as the descent speed gradually increases, just like we saw in the chart Richard showed us. Eventually, the floors are being crushed faster than 12 floors per second, pushing out one half million cubic feet of air per floor with a horizontal expulsion feed of 484 miles an hour, more than twice the airspeed of a very big tornado, 100,000 pounds per square inch, hundreds of times more pressure than Gage claimed, that can curl house-sized objects hundreds of feet. Here's a picture of a palm tree impaled by a piece of plywood during Hurricane Andrew with wind speeds of around one-fourth of World Trade Center wind speeds. The wind theory of lateral ejection is criticized by some scientists who have proposed two other possible explanations. One I call the bow and arrow theory, where the inward bowing columns snap back out during the collapse and shoot steel like arrows horizontally. Also the pinball theory, where heavy objects are dropping outside the perimeter at free fall and hitting other objects. Like a pinball, much of the energy is conserved as the object changes direction, so an object dropping at 100 miles an hour could easily be deflected and shot sideways at 70 miles an hour. Scientists have hypothesized all three explanations, but no one outside the 9-11 truth movement has ever proposed explosives as an explanation. If you have hundreds of extra reinforced charges, detonators, and wiring durable enough to survive getting hit by a plane, why were they not seen in the thousands of pictures and videos of the wreckage? And where is the noise? You can't have it both ways by talking about quieter thermites and then having explosives hurling multi-ton objects out. If Richards thinks explosives cause these huge objects to fly out, where were the monster deafening explosive sounds? If you make an explosive quieter, you will, in exact proportion, make it less good at cutting steel. That's because the noise is part of the destructive wave that creates the demolition. You can't say that they were masked. You can't mask the sound of an explosion big enough to utterly destroy 220 acres of floor space by any more than about eight decibels. Richard also does not account for the half million cubic feet of air being expelled on every floor at the rate of 12 floors per second. What does he think all that air can do? Nothing? He has never answered me in our debate. Is he saying that the winds or bowed columns snacking, snapping back or the pinball effect cannot account for lateral ejection of large objects? Do bombs make more sense than any of these explanations? So now let's talk about those squibs which popped out all over the Twin Towers after the collapses began. I say that their air pressure pushing smoke and dust out weakened windows and collapsing columns. Richard Gage says they are timed or perhaps mistimed explosions. He asserts that, quote, air pressure will fill the room with air uniformly before it breaks any windows, close quote. Not true. The air may have moved too fast for pressure variation to reach equilibrium. And the last time I got a flat tire, it blew out at the weakest point only. It didn't cause the whole tire to explode. The weakest window would be the first to break, and then the pressure drops so none of the other windows have to break. The towers were 90% air, 95% air, which was pushed out and down at over 100 miles an hour. Shockwaves were traveling eight times faster than the collapse and wreaking havoc on the building. 
Some jets of smoky air were pushed from the building through random weak points. Richard says there was a pattern to these squibs appearing between certain windows, but a recent David Chandler video shows squibs coming out of the corners of the building as the columns broke apart. So we can say the squibs had a pattern to them, except when they did not. If the squibs were controlled demolition, then squibs would go off before the collapse begins, as we saw earlier in the classic controlled demolition. Squibs happened only after the collapse began. Survivors felt what they called a hurricane wind strong enough to push them down the stairs. If squibs were explosive demolition charges, they would have created structural deformations, which these squibs did not. So let's take a look at that squib video. He says the squibs blew up very fast. If these squibs were explosions, they would have started very fast and then petered out. But at first, some of these squibs, like this one, are small, they move slowly, and gradually grow as air pressure from the collapse increases. 95% of the building was air, and when most of the air flew out, causing squibs, dust ejection, and maybe ejection of large steel pieces, 110 stories eventually crushed down to one-tenth of that height, 11 or 12 stories. Now, if these squibs were premature charges, then other charges would not have gotten off at all, especially the ones near the crashes, and evidence of the signal receivers and demolition triggers of some kind would have been found. To quote Professor Michael Brown, the hundreds of people who worked to remove debris from Ground Zero were some of the country's most experienced and respected demolition veterans. They, of all people, possessed the expertise to recognize evidence of controlled demolition if it existed. None of these people has come forward with suspicions that explosives were used. In our debate, Richard never explained the complete absence of used up demolition equipment in the rubble. I've now talked about some of the enormous natural forces that made the collapse of the Twin Towers inevitable. I've talked about the power of gravity overcoming even the strongest structural resistance. I've talked about 482 mile per hour winds with a hundred with a half million cubic feet of air getting squeezed out of every collapsing floor at the rate of 12 floors per second. In my March 6, 2011 debate with Richard Gage, he had no answers for these. He kept throwing out claims that no layperson could answer without careful research. His presentation is impressive, his argument is forceful, but the scientists I talk with all have much better explanations for everything Richard talks about. I have spent hundreds of hours answering his claims, but we're not finished yet. We still have to talk about all that pulverized concrete and steel, Richard's allegations of molten steel and the debris, and the eyewitness accounts of explosions. And that is what exactly what we'll be doing in our next installments. Thank you.